In World renowned lecture, she consults with higher education institutions throughout the United States and the world on creating multicultural and gender fair curriculum. She is founder and co director of the National SEED, which stands for Seeking Educational Equity and Diversity Project on Inclusive Curriculum. The transformational SEED project helps teachers, counselors, and administrators create their own year long safe based seminars on making school climates, curricula, and teaching methods more gender fair and multicultural and equitable. Macintosh is the author of many influential articles on curriculum change, women's studies, Systems of Honor and Privilege. She is best known for authoring the groundbreaking article, White Privilege and Male Privilege, a personal account of coming to see correspondence through work in women's studies. This analysis, and in a shorter form, White Privilege, unpacking the physical mindset, which you should all have in front of you, have been instrumental in putting the dimension of privilege into discussions on gender, race, and sexuality. The essay set forth the concept of white privilege, a theoretical construct that has since significantly influenced racist theory and practice, as well as other movements. A gifted teacher, Macintosh has taught English, American studies, and women's studies at Brewerly School, Harvard University, Trinity College in Washington, D.C., Durham University in England, and Wellesley College, among other institutions. Macintosh directs gender, race, and inclusive education projects which provides workshops on privileged systems, feelings of fraudulence, and diversifying workplaces, curricula, and teaching methods. She's also featured in the documentary film, Mirrors of Privilege, Making Whiteness Visible. She is co-founder of the Rocky Mountain Women's Institute in Colorado and has been consulting editor to Sage, a scholarly journal on black women. In addition to having two honorary degrees, she's the recipient of the Quiggins Dean Award for distinguished educational leadership from Columbia Teachers College. Now, following tonight's lecture on privilege from Dr. McIntosh, we'll have a brief question and answer session. We ask that you all be respectful of both the speakers, or our speaker and others, um, and we now welcome <coughs> Dr. McIntosh. Thank <laughs> you. 
<coughs> I was very conceited, um, but also very identified with authority. So I thought it was miserable to have this thing called a Quaker meeting in which you had an hour of silence and anybody could speak <coughs> briefly. But I thought if anybody could speak, just any old person can speak, then it must be a worthless event. I tolerated the Quakers in those days. I was just 15. I was looking for a pulpit and a person singing out truths. And here was this stupid Quaker silence. Now, however, and I, I remember presenting that they made the studying easy. Mr. Burton told us physics is nothing but common sense wrapped around things you've seen all your life. I just give you the names. He said, you've known about momentum and inertia ever since you were a little baby bouncing things around in your playpen. I give you the names. And I thought, how stupid. If all it gives us is the names, he's not earning his money. Physics should be hard. He is now what I consider to be an educational leader. He said, I will have you build something six times this year, and then we will study what you've built. So the first thing we built was a battery. And my lab partner was a very small, very white, shy, almost voiceless young man. And together we built a battery, and together we studied it. And that went on all year. He could hardly say a word. He was a first year student, and I was a lordly junior. But recently, this small, shy man has won the Nobel Prize in physics. I credit Mr. Burton of the Quaker educational progressive tradition with giving this small, shy boy the courage to follow his train of thought in physics <coughs> and to be awarded the Nobel Prize on, on the strength of that. But we each have in us these trains of thought that we weren't meant to think. And I think following them, my hope for you for this evening is that my account of how I came to do that with regard to privilege will inspire your own respect for your unlikeliest trains of thought, no matter where they take you. Of course, one has to be careful in a world in which we're not all evaluated equally. We're not all seen to have useful trains of thought. But I believe the personality is very plural. And what you develop in the way of skills in university and school are just a fraction of the skills we have. And these trains of thought that may bring you to your, the heart of your life very likely appear not in cast in academic ways, but they can rescue us from a life which seems somehow unsettled to the very end. What I will do in the next 40 minutes is I will tell you how I came to see I have white skin privilege. And then, because you have, all of you, your own experience of advantage and disadvantage, you will have an opportunity to talk to anyone, an opportunity to tell about some of your own experience of unearned disadvantage and unearned advantage. I believe we all have both. Or rather, anybody who got into this room has a combination of things that pushed us ahead through no virtue of our own, but because somebody cared, or an institution or a scholarship fund was there for us when we needed it. And things for which we have been made to suffer, starting from teasing and bullying in the playground. And that nobody got into this room without a mix of things that pushed us ahead and pushed us down. And the way I see social justice is, it's a kind of hypothetical line. It doesn't exist, just hypothetical. There are seats up here if you would like to take the row. The way I 
I see the hypothetical line of justice is that it runs parallel to the floor, and that means parallel also to Mother Earth. It runs parallel to the ground. And it is the line in which things feel fair. Above it, one is pushed up to more than one has earned in the way of being supported, believed in, applauded, had the door open for one, had faith put in one, pushed up through no virtue of one's own, but because of accidents of birth and placement in our structured, stratified society. And below it, one is pushed down, doubted, <coughs> not told about the jobs coming up, teased and bullied. Joked about, harassed, persecuted, perhaps a victim of genocide. All that happens below the hypothetical line of justice. And tonight, after I've told about how I came to see white skin privilege, I'll ask you to testify to some of your own experience above and below the hypothetical line of justice, social justice. After that, I will make good on my promise to talk about contesting <coughs> the privilege systems. And I'll talk about how, I come to, how I've come to use my white skin privilege to weaken the system of white skin privilege. But any of us can use the power we were arbitrarily given in a privileged system of privilege and disadvantage to weaken that system. <laughs> so, three years in a row, men and women in a seminar I was leading in Wellesley Centers for Women, oh, it, it, it fell apart. Now it didn't visibly fall apart, but this was a seminar for women and men, and suddenly in the spring of the year, after beautiful monthly meetings, September through March, the men and the women did not want to talk to each other anymore. And I was bewildered because these were extremely nice men. They were also brave men because our subject was new research on women and how it could potentially change all the liberal arts disciplines, even the sciences and math. New research on women. And these men had to be, they took a lot of flack on their own campuses for coming to a feminist organization. Wellesley's a women's college. It wasn't feminist then. In fact, somebody as I arrived there 30 years said, oh, don't be fooled about Wellesley. Wellesley is actually Princeton in drag. <laughs> it's never been a very pro-woman place, except superficially. However, we were trying to do something that was more than superficial, asking how would the liberal arts curriculum in all of its divisions and departments change if it re reflected the fact that women are half the world's population? That's a radical question today, even. And um, the men were our allies, but in the spring of the year, suddenly the thing, the men and the women didn't like the dinner together, the men, clustered <laughs> an affinity group, as Beverly Daniel Tatum might say, they all grouped together. <clears throat> we didn't like them, but they were very nice. So I didn't want to end this seminar. Every year it was oversubscribed. It was bringing people from New York, Connecticut, all the New England states, New Jersey, as far south as Philadelphia, people would drive up to Wellesley for this five-hour meeting once a month and the good dinner that we had. I didn't want to end it partly because it carried money, it carried my salary, the grant that funded it, but also it was good. People wanted to be there. So I thought, I will look through my notes and find out exactly how my facilitation skills failed, what I did wrong. And I will confess that to the foundation that funded us. 
and ask for another three years of funding, I would say, I failed as a facilitator because I would find out by reading my notes, but if you will give me another $325,000, I will mend my ways, and we will have three more years of seminar. So I started to look through my notes to write my proposal to the Mellon Foundation, and I found actually I hadn't done anything wrong. I found that my careful, careful note taking showed that as the year went on, the women asked a perfectly natural question, which is, can't we get these materials from women's studies into the freshman courses? Can't we put them in at the beginning? Why wait? the senior seminar in which you critique what you've just done for three, four years. Why not put it in at the beginning? Materials on women from the beginning. Gender balance from the beginning. And then when the women would raise this each year, it was a different group of women each year, but it's just a natural question. The men, to a person, said, we're sorry, you know, this is a great seminar, we love being here, but you can't put materials on women into the first year courses because the syllabus is full, the reading list is full, the, exam, the exams are full. There's so much to cover, we can't cover anything else. And one man, because I wrote very carefully what they said, in good faith told us, when you're trying to lay the foundation stones for knowledge, you can't put in soft stuff. So thanks a lot. But he was a nice man. But the half of the population that is us, he considered soft. And I remember thinking, he doesn't understand labor pains. <laughs> we are not soft. But he was very nice. Truly nice and brave to be with us. Now I know what he was saying is, the knowledge system is full. Not knowledge is full without women, but the system of knowledge we were all inheriting was full without women. And then, another year, another man had said, see, that first year the students are trying to teach, to uh, decide on their, their major. That's their discipline. And if you want kids to think in a disciplined way, you can't put in extras. And every one of these very nice men is born of a woman. And she has become extra in his mind. And I'm wondering, how did this happen? That, that all of the mothers, and the spouses, and the female children, these are faculty members, all of them, all, and everybody's sister, and everybody's aunts has become extra. How did this happen? And I went back and forth in my head and said, are these men nice? And I knew they were. I honored them. And a lot of us wanted to marry them, too. They were so, you know, a man who joins a feminist seminar is real man and marriageable. <laughs> are these men nice? Or are they oppressive? Because these comments on our being soft and extra, they're, they're oppressive. And I thought I had to choose, nice or oppressive, and then I was rescued by remembering back to a time when I read black women's writings of 1979 and 80, in which the black women had, had just spelled it out as though it were the Lord's own truth. White women are oppressive to work with. And that wasn't the point of their essays. They were trying to counsel their younger black sisters, not to be too disappointed, if and this was the subject of the essays, if they tried to join up with women's studies, because white women had formed the field. And these senior black women were saying, don't be blindsided. Don't assume that women's studies will receive you with open arms. Yes, you are women. Yes, we as black women have some experience, but don't expect the whites will assume that you add to the field, that you add the to the field. So they were just saying, just remember what you're up against. White women are oppressive to work with. And I remember reading, by now it was six years later, and I remember reading those 
those essays, and I remember my first thought had been, I don't see how they can say that about us. I think we're nice. <laughs> I thought of it in a kind of line. I was offended that our niceness had come through to them. But, because <laughs> our niceness was clear to me. But the second poem, I remembered that I had bought in 1980. It's embarrassing now, it's outright racism. But this is where I was in 1980. I thought, I especially think we're nice if we work with them. I especially think we're nice if we work with black women. Oh, and I remember, I remember the thinking that and saying, oh, I hope my attitude didn't show. I hope I was so nice they never noticed it. And then I spent a couple of years mulling on that and said, no, actually, they did notice. They, they understood my condescension and my feeling that I deserved thanks for working with people I was taught to look down on. But I think they worked with me because I was trying. It was obvious to them that I was trying. So then I thought, all right, the men are nice. And they are oppressive. <coughs> Niceness has nothing to do with it. They were taught to be oppressive, as I was taught to be oppressive, but for different reasons. They were taught to be oppressive because of their sex. Under patriarchy, they were taught, and I was taught this too, men have knowledge. Men make more knowledge. Men publish knowledge. Men profess knowledge as professors. Men run the university presses, and men run the big university of the big research universities. And these men, though they are nice, have learned what they were taught, and I was taught, that knowledge is male, and men are knowers. And that was a relief, because then I could understand why my husband can't ask for directions. <laughs> you know, I could just bop out of the car and say, we're lost. He, he can't. His identity was formed on being a knower, <laughs> a white male knower. He said he teaches at a medical school. That doesn't help either. That puts him in even, even more and more of a knower, even though most of the medicine he learned in medical school is now obsolete. But still, the idea that doctors know, he had, he had internalized that. So he can't ask for directions. <laughs> well, I said, well, Here's the parallel. And niceness has not nothing to do with this either. That though I was the wrong sex to get into the knowledge world, I was the right color. And when the federal government came and sat down on Harvard University and said, you 33 men, you must hire a woman, they hired two of us. And I was found out saying in retrospect, we were both white. Because though we were the wrong sex to get into the Harvard teaching core, we were the right color. And we had been taught whites have knowledge, whites make more knowledge, whites publish knowledge and profess knowledge and run the university presses and run the big research universities. We'd all been taught this, and it's not our fault. But I had internalized the idea that knowledge is white. And as a white person, I was a knower. And to this day, I mentally second guess all of the staff who of color of my main project. The seed project, which is one of the loves of my life, is now 25 years old. I highly recommend it as, a, as a development for students and for faculty. But what I want to say about my frame of mind was I had internalized that. I knew better than all people of color because I was white. And it wasn't conscious in me, but it was unconscious. And to this day, in the seed staff, just nine men and women of color and five whites, I doubt and second guess the, the staff of color as soon as they open their mouths. I'm testing what they say against my quote superior white knowledge. Unless that day 
I have put into my soul or mind or both what I call the alternative software. It's a chip. And unless I install the chip of respect for everyone and the chip that reminds me that I've heard, my major teachers have been people of color, then I will condescend to the staff of color. And they know it. They're just happy when I put that chip in and recognize them for all they teach me. So then I thought, well, no wonder I can get grants and my colleagues at Wilson Centers for Women can't get grants if they're African American. Because I've got the whole knowledge system working for me. It's on my side and it pushes me above the hypothetical line of social justice. And in addition, the people we get money from at the Wellesley Centers for Women, those are banks and foundations. And they're run by whites. And whites have given other whites the reputation for being good with money, honest, reliable, steady, and good with calculations. So I have the money system and the knowledge system on my side. Oh dear. At that point, my self-esteem was just knocked under, knocked out from under me. I had thought that according to the myth of meritocracy, I had what I had, I had earned. Now I saw what I had that made me feel I was sitting pretty was largely given to me, not entirely, but largely given to me by having been born to parents who had some money, who assumed I would go to college, who had a house and a car, and a circle of friends that would vouch for me and write recommendations for me, and that I'd been born to people who would send me to a private school, which would then send me on to a private college, and that I had risen through the ranks of English teachers, not because I was so good, but for a woman, at least I was white, and that made me better than any person of color, and promotable, and supportable and personable. And I hated the idea that I hadn't earned what I had, but I began to see this was nature. Now, this is the point I, where I urge you to follow your own train of thought, whether or not it's on anything about power. It may be about anything at all, but here's where I urge you, just when you're feeling your old ideas are crumpling on you, to follow your train of thought and take yourself very seriously, going back through your experience and not blaming or shaming yourself, but seeing your experience as your teacher about your next steps. So in my particular case, what happened is I thought there's got to be more. I think I've seen something. It's not discrimination. It's the opposite. And I had it. I began to name it unearned advantage. And then my mind balked. I asked, okay, at the Wellesley Centers, what do I have going for me that my black colleagues don't have? Except for the money system and the knowledge system both favoring me as a white person. And my, my supposedly educated mind said, nothing. So I asked again, on a daily basis, by contrast with my African-American friends, what do I have that they don't have beside the support of the knowledge system and the money system? And once again, this so-called educated mind, with its three degrees, said nothing. It was saying, don't go there, or there's nothing there. I'm not sure what it was saying, but it was saying, stop. And I'm in the habit of, maybe, of having, maybe you are too, having conversations with my mind, in which it says something, and then it says something, you say something else, and it says something else, and you go back and forth in your mind. My mind was refusing to have a conversation on this. So, I had to pray on it. 
it may not be the kind of prayer you recognize. It was more like a demand. And if, in the course of your schooling, you have read the poetry of Gerald Manley Hopkins, that'll help you to understand the frame of mind I'm talking about. I was desperate, and in his terrible sonnets, he was in a spiritual crisis, and I was in need of help. And the only source I had was my unconscious mind, and so I went to sleep one night, and this was the third try. I said, if I have anything on a daily basis that my friends of color don't have, except the knowledge system and the money system working for me, show me! And in the middle of the night, as though it was delivered on a little plate, I got a sentence. And I turned on the light, and I wrote it down. And I remember thinking as I wrote it down, Oh, this isn't anything. This is nothing. This is a big bunch of nothing. And I wrote it down. Next morning I looked at it. It became, and it still seemed like a big bunch of nothing. Now I think it's huge. It became the first in a, in a list of 46 examples that came to me. Most of them in the middle of the night. over the next three months. And once my husband said, what are you writing in the middle of the night? And I said, Ken, I'm, it's, it, it's not fair. There, see, there's this, it's a big, it's a big, I, I didn't know this. It's, and he fell back asleep. Yeah. <laughs> so about two months later, or one month later, he asked again, what are you writing? And I said, ah, it's, it's enormous. This is, I was never taught this. I'm writing stuff I was never taught. But see, and he fell back asleep again. And when I almost finished in about month uh, two and maybe the final week, the 12 weeks, he did a wonderful thing. I love this man. He, he, um, he, he got, he put his, propped himself up on his elbow there and his pajamas and said, okay, tonight I'm really going to listen. What is it that you're writing? But by then I knew. And so I said, Ken, I'm writing down stuff I don't want to know. And I'll talk to you about it in the morning. Because by then I had this little language, this unearned advantage. So number one in the piece of paper you've been given, do you all have a copy? That's great. I've got one. Um, number one is the first one that came. I can, if I wish, arrange to be in the company of people of my race most of the time. That's the one I thought was a great big bunch of nothing. But now I see it as very important. It keeps me from having to feel alone in institutional life. areas of Boston keeps me from having to feel alone, the only, the free, the misunderstood, um, the rude. I'm awfully sorry about number one, uh, number two. I put class in it by mistake. That was a big, that was a big mistake. Because this paper, I've been faulted many times for mixing class in with race. I should have just written this for number two. If I should need to move, I can be pretty sure of renting or purchasing housing in an area in which I would want to live. I think that was accurate. But when I said, which I can afford, well, right now, prices around Boston are so high. Um, there's a lot of class involved there. Some people go, oh, it's just a rich woman who's written this paper and she can afford anything. Otherwise, I think I purified the list well enough so that I kept out the elements of class and just um, and ability, physical ability, and heterosexuality, which I put in a different part of the paper, 
and I kept this one um, focused on race. Number four, I don't know what Baltimore is like, but I can go shopping alone most of the time pretty well assured that I will not be followed or harassed. And since this is an autobiographical paper, I, didn't, I don't say that these points are true for you, just the true for me. Number six, when I'm told about our national heritage or about civilization, I'm shown that people of my color made it what it is. Seven, I can be sure that my children will be given curricular materials that testify to the existence of their race right up through graduate school, and in every single course, whiteness will be visible. Eight, if I want to, I can be pretty sure of finding a publisher for this piece on white privilege. Because when I write these things, I'm heard as rationally analytical. Whereas a woman of color writing these things about what white people get will be accused of grandstanding or grinding her axe or not realizing that the civil rights movement fixed all this. She has much less credibility. In other words, one white privilege is to be believed when you say white privilege exists. I'm happy to say that number nine is obsolete in part. There were two all-white music shops, if you can imagine that, in Newton, Mass, where I was living at this time. So I wrote, I can go into a music shop and count on finding the music that my race represented. But I can't imagine going into a music store now that's all white. Um, you'd have to <laughs> decimate the collection, the, kind of, the collection of available music down to about 1%. I mean, really, it's, it's not possible anymore. Well, that, this was written 22 years ago. By the way, the people in my, um, in my building who run the working papers selection turned down this paper in 1986. They said this isn't up to our standard. This is just anecdotal. This is merely anecdotal. So we can't publish it as a working paper of the Centers for Women. And they said it doesn't have any footnotes. So I understood that. Then I began to sell it like anything. I made $26,000 selling copyright to it in the first year. So I said to my colleagues, you can sell this for $6 a paper and make a lot of money for our institution. Why don't you list it as a working paper? They said they'd take another look at it. They look at it again, and they say it lowers the standard. It's not scholarship. So I understood that. But then a voice woke me up in the middle of the night, which is the same voice that gave me these examples. And the voice said, Freud didn't have footnotes. <laughs> <laughs> so I took that to the working papers committee, and I said, Freud didn't have footnotes. This is original work. And they said, okay. <laughs> so it quickly became our bestseller, and that was in 88. Now, it's been our bestseller ever since. It's been our bestseller ever since it was published in 88. And, um, but I have a Chinese friend who says, Peggy, she's very frank. She says, Peggy, the reason it's your bestseller is all the other papers are very dull. <laughs> I think she's right because the other papers are written in that academic language in which you imply nobody wrote the paper. You keep the word I out of it. And many dissertations must be written in that kind of language. It's a big, it, it, it's, it's ridiculous, isn't it? It sounds as though nobody wrote the paper. As though no I participated in the generation of this knowledge. But anyway, as you can see, mine is autobiographical. And they accepted it, and it's still our bestseller. So I'm going to do um, just a few more readings, and then it's your turn. Number 18. I can be pretty sure that if I ask to talk to the person in charge, I will be facing a person of my race. Now, I'm happy to say that right now, my town has a black mayor. My uh, state has a black governor. And our country has a black president. So this one has become less true on the, in many ways for me. Um, 
but it was true at the time I wrote it that almost every time I wanted to com complain, I would be complaining to a person who was white. And that was a strength for me. It gave me power. <coughs> this one is very true in my state to this moment. If a traffic cop pulls me over or if the IRS audits our tax returns, I'm pretty sure I haven't been singled out because of my race. 21, I can go home from most meetings of organizations I belong to, feeling somewhat tied in rather than isolated, out of place, outnumbered, unheard, <laughs> held at a distance or fear. And today I loved meeting with people from Alana and from the justice, social justice and civic um, group. It is great to have these affinity, affinity groups so you don't feel so left out. Number 25 is subtle. If my day, week, or year is going badly, I need not ask of each negative episode or situation whether it has racial overtones. My colleagues of color can't afford to be naive on whether negative things have racial overtones with them in our buildings. And finally, this is the best known and most quoted, I can choose blemish cover or bandages and so-called flesh color and have them more or less match my skin. I found if I didn't write these things down, they would be gone by morning because I did not want to know them and they wrecked my self-image. But I got it reconstituted in a transformative way. I'm just a body in the body of the world. I'm not an excellent person. I'm just a person like other persons. And if you follow your own train of thought, you may find there is the relief of finding that your life is more coherent, and you're more likable, and you're also contributing in a different way to the world rather than simply competing in it. And then the question came up for me, having seen these unearned advantages, what can I do to use them to weaken the system of unearned advantage, and that all depends on your values. I don't feel men must try to weaken the system of patriarchy. It depends on their values. If they think it's just fine for men to be in control, they have no obligation to, to try to equalize relations between the sexes. And I feel the same is about, true about race. I don't know, have an obligation to use my whiteness to weaken the system of white privilege. But it depends on my values, and my values are. I have loved discovering how not to be hated. I have loved to make common cause for the people who have so much to teach me and who had it harder than me growing up. So for me, it's an open question, but I've got another paper here on ways I've contested privilege, and that'll come after the time when we do our exercise together right now. So please don't start to testify yet. We know what the subject is going to be, but please first choose to partner with one other person, and then the, once you begin to speak, and I'll tell you when to begin, the, part, the person who's closest to this wall over here will be the first speaker, and each of you will get one minute to speak. And as you know, the first subject will be some of your experience on your disadvantage that you have. And the second, each of you will do that, and then the second part will be some of your experience of unearned advantage, and there's some doors open for you without your having to kick them down. But please don't begin yet, just identify who you will be speaking with, and if you are extra, sorry about that word, please stand up, and then you get paired with the person who's also looking for a partner. So, you eight are perfect, you're perfect. But, but in the next row, maybe somebody needs to stand up. I see. You need a partner? Okay. Closest to that wall. Please tell your partner for one minute. I'll talk. 
had unearned disadvantage in your life. It could have to do with anything, your body type, what you were teased for or bullied about in the playground, the neighborhood you grew up in, the church you went to, how people discriminated against you because of any of those things. Do you need a partner? About that? Good. Um, anybody need a partner? I can be the partner of the uh, person. <laughs> Good afternoon. 
I do with relations to money, to education, whether you grew up in a neighborhood that was seen as a good neighborhood or whether you were given books to read that white people called good books, and that helped you ahead. Whatever helped you to be accepted, those are unearned advantages. Of course, we work for what happens to us, but this is the circumstantial part we're talking about today. Where it happened to you, you didn't create the situation, but it helped you. For example, Loyola had a scholarship fund. You needed a scholarship. You didn't invent the fund, but you benefited. Because some colleges have, and universities have virtually no scholarships. Okay, first speaker, back to you. Unearned advantages.
the first case they said, man, we're just trying to protect you. But um, finally I got my act together and two years later I went back and they said again, man, we're just trying to protect you. And I said, no, no, you've got a protection racket going and you're creating the bad race relations that you now claim you're protecting me from. And they were very startled to see an old lady with her hair in a bun <laughs> accusing accusing them of having a protection racket going. So it hasn't happened since. That second visit was about four years ago. I am strongly in favor of um, hiring people of color. And in, as you know, in my main project, there are nine people of color and five whites. That's my choice, also based on what I've heard from people of color who have been my major teachers. I promote the works of people who I sometimes don't even want to read, but I do read and learn from and then promote. And these are Japanese American writers, or Japanese writers, Latin American writers. Those I was taught to just look overlook. I now read them, learn from them, and promote their work. And as a point, I have more clout in promoting them than I would if I were of their ethnicities. I try to di diversify most of the groups I work with by saying this is all for a white group. You know, it gets a white. It got our way through the history of white management groups. But anyway, I try, really try to avoid being in a white company. So I live by a river, and um, there's about to be a wonderful assault on the invasive plants in the river. But it's not a white group working on that. But you know, the whites can work on that. But I like to be in communities. I like to put my time in with groups. I um, choose to live on less money than we used to so that we can give more money to social justice every year. And I'm willing to talk now about white superiority and white supremacy. Own them. Put them in my vocabulary. I was taught that white supremacy, whites should be in charge. And white superiority. Whites are better than other people. And now I, I talk about that and realize that doesn't mean I'm a terrible person. It's circumstantial. I was born to believe in you, white superiority. And my husband and I have marched um, often on Boston Common or in Washington. And I organize projects and invest time and things like mailing lists and I intervene and campaign. Just told Elizabeth Warren I would be willing to campaign for her in my state. It's a mixture of trying to raise my own awareness and use what strength I have to try to alter conditions for the next generation or for this generation. A lesbian woman came up to me after a talk and said, Peggy, it's just exactly the same for us. You have all kinds of privileges I don't have. I said, I had never thought of that. One characteristic of privilege is when you're benefiting from it, you're likely not to notice it. So I told her, I, 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 I just never thought of it. So I went home and wrote what I considered a bit beginner's list of heterosexual privileges. And, um, they start with, I can talk about, say, the events of last weekend without fearing it may cost me my job. And I can go to hotels um, and restaurants without having um, harassment from me and my partner. And I can, um, I, I am, this is the way it goes. My sister is lesbian and my niece is lesbian are never consulted on their secret is with um, staying with a partner. They're never considered as models. But my husband and I, who've been together for 47 years, are considered as models. So I can, if I wish, tell people the secrets of the long um, relationship.
relationship. I'm not complaining uh, about this, but it's not fair that we are considered gurus. And I can assume that people will consider my marriage a, a, an indication of my likability and my mental health. My niece, my nephew, and my uh, sister aren't considered to be models of mental health because they have stayed with same-sex partners. Of course, it does take a fair amount of mental health to be married to the same man for 47 years. <laughs> but but the, the mental health had to go in both directions. It took something from him to be married to me for 47 years. So in any case, that's another list, and it's in the original paper, which I'm distributing tonight for anybody who wants, and I'll put along that wall. The, um, the main way in which I have contested white skin privilege is to call into question the five major myths that govern the United States thinking. The United States ideology, and I'm distributing that paper also tonight. And these, and the paper has this subject, this title: White people facing race, uncovering myths that keep racism in place. And the first myth I, I really attack is the myth of meritocracy, which is that the unit of society is the individual, which I don't believe is true. It's only partially true. The, the unit of society is the individual, and whatever the individual ends up with must be what that he or she individually wanted, worked for, earned, and deserved. That is a myth. So I've contested that very strongly, not only in this little paper, but in longer papers. I wrote seven papers last year. is the myth of monoculture, which goes this way. And the myth of monoculture can sully a university as well as the society as a whole. The myth of monoculture is there's just one big culture, and we're all in it in pretty much the same way, and experiencing it in pretty much the same way. And if it's not working for you, there's something wrong with you. That's the myth of monoculture. Such a temptation to roost in that myth and just project onto anybody else who isn't enjoying the, the myth, because <laughs> it's only a myth, it's not a reality, project onto them a defect. So assimilation always has as its root the push toward the monocultural idea. You can assimilate with one of your plural selves without touching your soul. But for people who think the assimilated you is the only you, they need to do more homework multiculturally. You have many selves beyond the assimilated one that has learned how to get along in mainstream white culture. The third myth is the myth of manifest destiny, which is that God intended white people to take the continental land mass, we now call the United States, take it away from Indian people and kill, kill or decimate the people. That God intended that. And the myth of manifest destiny then went on to infect the ideology of colonialism, that God intended us to take over darker skinned people or people of other, other cultures. The fourth myth is the myth of white moral elevation, and it's hard for me to describe it except that I grew up thinking that the, that the people who were in charge of anything were really the best people. <laughs> you can see how that leads to the myth of white moral superiority. That is, the reason whites are in charge of our major institutions is because we're so good at it, right? Well, now there should be a hollow laugh from me. <laughs> but I, I truly believed it, that the principal of the school was the best, or the brightest, or both the best and the brightest. I believed in the best and the brightest, and the fact they were all white didn't matter. It's just that they were the best, weren't they? That's the, the 
myth that it makes sense for white people to control the world. And of course that invests our, that, or in fact, our foreign policy as, as well, through the ages, through the, for centuries. And then, finally, uh, it's maybe a come down for you, but it's very important, I think, the myth of white racelessness, that other people have race, we're just normal. That there's no such thing as European American racial identity. We're just the people. And then those other people, they have race, that's their problem. But we are racially just as we're just as racial as any other human beings. And of course, there, all the racial definitions are being knocked into a cocked hat. Those are the five myths. And by promulgating this attack on them, I guess that's how I mostly use those three degrees I was granted in college, trying to write in such a way that to academics I will be credible, and that their writing of history and lit about literature and of science will carry few of, fewer of these myths, and that's how I try to use my white privilege to weaken the grip of white privilege on the academy. Now, this is our Q&A period, and the floor is open for any of you to comment and or ask. Yes, and why don't you stand up so we can all hear you. We have the privilege of asking where would we like to go, but not how would we be received in the places we would like to go. And I applaud your teacher too, that's just great. But I'm glad you didn't turn off because you could have said, I know everything, I could have written the paper. And all these losers here have to learn this. <laughs> but I know this stuff. So you could have taken the high road.
Thank you for telling us. You've 
you decided not to keep the central ground and try to manage all the extras, but just step back and join the human circle. If you're a white male who stayed to this point in the talk, this probably describes you. And it's, I don't know if it's transformation for you, transformational for you to join the human circle, but it was transformational for me. So good luck in continuing. And, and uh, many people on many campuses would have said, I identified with her. She's saying just what I know. We are extra. And we want to dispel the model minority myth. And we want people to not think Asia is a country. <laughs> we, we would like them to educate themselves to the tremendous differences between different Asian cultures and histories. <laughs> Thank you for speaking. I, I just want to say something really quick. I think that one of the major obstacles to uh, breaking down these barriers and stuff is that the language that's used, because Whenever I hear manifest destiny, if you if you decouple that from what people meant it as, it sounds awesome. Manifest destiny, I'm taking destiny and I'm making it into a corporeal thing. And then but then when you when you read about it, you're like, well, I don't understand how how we could have let a phrase so grandiose describe something so awful. And there's a lot of that kind of stuff. It, it's all this, it's, it's language and positioning through language that allows people to kind of get, uh, rope other people in unwittingly into this type of thing. It's a deep comment. And uh, as you were speaking, ethnic cleansing came to my mind as another linguistic construct that cleans something up. So, so then, are you going to be a teacher, or are you now? Uh, I hope you will be, and that you will help students with their framing of things. Consider. <laughs> Attached to. 
I judged them by their attachments to powerful men. And the point, um, to, to go back to the liberal arts curriculum, I guess my paraphrase wasn't quite right. So you say yours again, please, your question. Which part? <laughs>
realize that. Once they've had enough serial testimony, they don't worry about who's in charge, who's got the power. It expanded like an airbag in my head, and I said, this can become a national project. All I have to do is teach people how to facilitate that way. And now people can come from anywhere. For a week of facilitation practice, you just practice twice in, in your serial testimonies. And then it become national and international. And that's what it is to, to this day. So I highly recommend this, and I hope Loyola will have a couple of seed seminars next year. 10 to 20 people meet monthly to discuss what they're doing in their way of um, their jobs here and how to make it more inclusive. And they draw on their experience and they do serial testimony, which is timed. And they meet once a month for three hours with a delicious meal. And they have the dean or they have the school or the school, the school um, K through 12 school, the principal or the head of the division vouches that they will pay the person's way, the facilitator's way to California for a week of training. That's where Nancy Livingston is among the staff of nine people of color and five whites. So here's the brochure. And last year, um, in this happy group of people in near San Francisco, training to become seed seminar facilitators were half people of color and half whites. Sorry, sorry to wait so long. No, that's fine. Um, I just wanted to ask you, um, what are your views on affirmative action, how some people view it as reverse racism? And um, how do you educate people on that? I strongly believe in it. The only reason I taught at Harvard was that the federal government said they had to hire a woman. I'm very sorry that some people have internalized um, the the view of whites that you've never had a problem. We're all just human and the doors are open. History doesn't tell us that the doors are open or that the systems aren't colorblind. So I'm very sorry about Ward Connerly. I think he's destructive in trying to end of affirmative action. He was gunning from Michigan and now he's going from Massachusetts. Talking about uh, 
your specific points that you said that number two was almost a mistake uh, because you you kind of incorporated class into it a little bit. Um, and I was wondering, uh, just knowing what we know about how race, class, as well as gender, just so intimately connected, uh, what can we learn about privilege knowing that information, knowing that class is so much a part of privilege? as well as race. I'm happy to say that the next White Privilege Conference, which you might get uh, like to fund you to attend, <laughs> <laughs> it starts in 10 days. Um, <laughs> starting at the end of next week. The subject is intersectionality because the people who for years sort of tried to keep other things out of the consideration of race so that whites couldn't divert onto them. And I saying, well, it's all class. And um, any more black men who started the white privilege conferences said, no, we're going to stay with race until we have a critical mass of people who see the importance of race then we may branch out. And the people who helped him branch out this year, um, the title of the conference, Intersectionality, meaning the intersections of various kinds of oppression. And those are the women of the group called the Matrix in the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. And they agree with you. Now, you were easy on me. I wonder why, I thought you were going to say, since all these things intersect, why are you apologizing? Thank you for being <laughs> and, and also, I was intentionally trying to filter. So this is what I read in the paragraph before the list begins. I have chosen those conditions which I think in my case attach somewhat more to skin color privilege than to class, religion, ethnic status, or geographical location, though of course, all of these other factors are intricately intertwined. And that's what you said too, that they're intertwined. And I do agree with that. And by the way, the great, the great forerunners on that whole intersectionality thing are the women of the Kambahi River Collective who published the Kambahi River Collective Statement in 1974. You can find that in the book called All the Women Are White, All the Blacks Are Men, But Some of Us Are Brave, colon, Black Women's Studies.
And also, Dr. McIntosh, if you're interested, she is placing um, more reading materials um, up here.